Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about sustaining a high performance. And uh, let me go here, right? Most companies, they start with their strategy, they're trying to implement it. Usually, like startups start at the growth phase. Uh, some point, right now we're living through this, I would say, interest rates go up, people become much more focused on the short term, and they say, okay, I want to see some profits. And companies, you know, pivot, they move from focusing on growth to moving towards profitability. And at some point when we continue through the cycle, somebody or the other will cut corners and we'll have a crisis. We'll have somebody that's cooking their books, somebody that's shipped a bad quality product, and uh, the company goes into crisis mode and then somebody, new management takes over, they start focusing on getting the company back to uh, order, they lost sight of growth. And then they need to focus again on innovation and growth. So this cycle continues, and it doesn't happen just for companies. Sometimes it happens for the whole economy. And uh, we have lived through these moments before, and uh, we are living through this again. So in the year 2000 or 1999, uh, I see lots of young faces here, but I've lived through this. Companies are valued on clicks and eyeballs, and uh, suddenly it was like, no, no, this is not enough. You need to show profits, and uh, you know, companies started, uh, you know, cost control and things like that. But we also saw our share of uh, scandals. So every eight to ten years, even economies seem to be living through this cycle, right? The question is, can we, you know, is it inevitable that you have to live through the cycle? Can we not? Uh, manage all three things at the same time? And I think the answer to that is yes. So let me... Uh, ah, this back doesn't work, I think. Or, ah, there we go. So what do we need? So here we have CEOs, senior leaders in companies executing their strategy and trying to balance these tensions of profit growth and control at the same time. Not one at a time, but trying to do all of these at the same time. And how do we do that? And the key to that is understanding human nature, human behavior, and leveraging the power of economic incentives, right? So that seems like the key to delivering on this so that, you know, a gentleman here talked about if we load up people with equity, they become very short-term oriented, we see they play this quarterly game and we have all these scandals. Absolutely, this seems to happen all the time, and there's some sense of inevitab inevitability about it, which is, you know, doesn't have to be that way. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a framework. One of my colleagues here at the Harvard Business School developed this called the Levers of Control. And we start with sort of what we call diagnostic control systems. Think of it as a performance management system where we link a company's strategy to sort of key deliverables, and there are a few generic strategies. Some companies are product-oriented, others are ones based on customer intimacy, you know, low cost. Uh, whatever your strategy is, you want to figure out what are the critical variables for success. Uh, these are easily available, what those metrics are, and you want to link them to people's performance evaluation, right? The key thing here is we absolutely need to have very high expectations of our workforce, of our employees. Holding people to high expectations is the key. Um, Rahul talks about you know, teaching at the Harvard Business School. You know, one thing we all take very seriously is our course ratings, how, how we are evaluated as instructors. That's a point of like, great pride among the faculty. I chair the second year of the MBA program, so I get to see all my colleagues' uh, teaching ratings. I've done this for eight, nine years now. And the single biggest predictor of who does well in the classroom is another question which says, does this professor hold us to high standards? So if you work your students hard and hold them to high standards, that is the best predictor of how you do as an instructor. And that's a bit counterintuitive, because in the moment, when you're cold calling students, when you're working them hard, they, they, they protest. They're like, you know, why are you being such a slave driver? But by the end of the semester, their views have changed. They're like, look back and say, my, I achieved something. I got something done this semester, and this is the person who helped me do it. 
So there's always this dichotomy. In the moment people may protest, by the end people are very grateful. So all of you, the one single thing you all need to do is have high expectations of people that report to you. Okay? So this is true for any organization. But it, having high expectations and then getting people motivated to achieve those expectations are two different things. And there are very, very many different ways of motivating people. So we're going to see that. Okay, so what happens when we set up these high expectations of people, you know, either you link them to incentives, you link it to promotion decisions, or uh, the other ways we will see how we could motivate people, just a pure challenge is enough. Sometimes, you know, why do we scale mountains? Because they are there. You know, just the challenge of the achieving something that has not been in, done before is enough of challenge, people will rise to the occasion. So when you have these high expectations of people, people get very innovative. But the person that's cooking the books, you know, shipping a bad quality product, is also being innovative. Not the kind of innovation we want, but they're also being innovative. So the key thing is, how do we get people to do the right kind of innovation and not cutting corners because they feel this pressure of high performance? And that's the role of belief system. You know, we need to articulate our core values. What is the grand purpose of our organization? Why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? And an organization that's not values-driven, where its purpose, the reason for us coming into work every day, if it's not articulated, we will fall into this problem of getting tempted and cutting corners. And so having articulating your values and beliefs is extremely important, right? So, but that's not enough. We also need to figure out what are our boundaries? What are the lines that we cannot cross? So again, I'm going to use the example of, uh, uh, you know, good institution universities. This may surprise you, but Ivy League schools have the highest level of cheating on exams. Right? Not something we are proud about, but it's been observed. Why is that? That's because people say it's a high-pressure performance, etc. So what, how, what is the response of these universities? Absolutely, here, you know, Rahul can vouch for this, every single classroom has our values written down, and we enforce the rules of the game we would have, say, the here are the consequences. If there is a transgression by the faculty or by the students, here are the consequences. And these things are enforced, and the case law is available, so that students can see that don't yield to this temptation. This is so critical for us. And it varies from industry to industry. Healthcare, uh, you're a regulated, you know, if you're a bank, what do the regulators think? So each one of us needs to think about what are the risks that people might put the organization into and how do we mitigate those risks? Because we want the innovation, we want the high performance, but not at the cost of our values and not by taking risks that are absolutely unacceptable to us. You do all these things, you set up the organization as a high performance organization, but only for today. What happens when you keep doing this is that you're doing very well and you're lulled into a sense of complacency, you're not thinking about the future. This is where the role of what we call the interactive systems comes in. What are the strategic uncertainties? What's happening in the environment in terms of technology, customer preferences, uh, government regulations, anything that's an opportunity or a threat, you need to be constantly scanning the environment for it because just running a good organization for today is not enough. You need to position yourself for tomorrow to make this sustainable. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay? So let's go back to the performance management system. We said, identify the critical success factors. Uh, these are not hard, but they need to be very tightly paired with your own strategy. So you cannot take somebody else's KPIs. These are not meant to be generic. They have to be tightly linked to your value creation. What is your business strategy, right? You do that, you set targets, you link performance evaluation to achievement of these targets. But the key thing is walking the talk. So uh, there are many organizations that will say, oh, our key to success is customer service, high levels of service, we're going to delight the customer. Like we see many retail banks adopt this strategy. Sounds good. Then time comes when you're evaluating the performance of a branch manager. 
outstanding financials, but their customer satisfaction is so-so. And that person says, if you don't give me the bonus, the maximum bonus I'm entitled to, I'm going to walk. And there are plenty of other competitors that will hire me. And that's the moment of truth. What are you going to do? Because if you truly mean that high levels of service is my new strategy, you better stick to it. You walk the talk. Very few people are willing to walk the talk, right? When it comes time for performance evaluation, people switch to the bottom line. And the gentleman there talked about, you know, quarterly pressure for performance, etc. Employees are like children. They sniff out hypocrisy right away. So if you don't walk the talk, and our kids do it all the time, right? You, you say one thing, but do something else. Our kids are the first one to point, pick, that, pick up on this. Same thing with employees. So that moment of truth is where your actions speak louder than your words. Okay? So you walk the talk, and beware of great inflation. You see this in so many organizations. It's cynical, yet it's so true. You know, Nobody wants to have the tough conversation with the people that report to them. So give them a high rating, they get on with it. So in fact, if you have a bad performer in many organizations, the way you get rid of the bad performer is by moving them to another division. But if you gave them a bad rating, nobody else will take them. So you give them a high rating so that they can get on with their way. Okay? This is how cynical it becomes in some organizations. You've got to fight that. Let me give you a counterexample to this. Right? All of us have had mentors. I'll submit none of us regard someone as a mentor if they always said, great job, you're outstanding, you're excellent. Mentors are not people who always pat you on the back and say, great job. These are people that say, you're good, but here's some potential I see in you that you don't have yet, so push for that and I'll be here to support you. So as leaders, you want to move to becoming mentors, the short you know, easy job of giving everyone a high grade is not what you want. Even the person you're giving a high grade sees through this. Okay? This is the flip side of, you know, faculty getting high ratings because they have high expectations of people. When you give high ratings to employees, which they themselves know is not deserved, they think less of you. So you're not doing yourself or the people that are evaluating a favor. You're much better off challenging everyone to rise to the next level. And if you help them, support them, get there, you got them for the rest of your life. Okay? And then they'll pass it on. Right? So beware of great inflation. Second thing in performance management is fight the incubation of bad news. What do I mean by this? Some organizations have these screamers. Screamers are people who yell at the person bringing the bad news. You know there's a screamer, what do you do? If I can push off giving the bad news till tomorrow, maybe it'll go away by itself, right? So what ends up happening is that there is bad news sitting in different parts of the organization. And only when there's a crisis do we find out, okay? So, you know, Warren Buffett says this, only in low tide do you find out who has been swimming naked. And low tide is coming. Right? Around the world, low tide is coming. This is when we will see, this is the season of scandals for the next two years. We're going to see a lot of scandals come because this is when we find out who's been swimming naked. But that comes from this incubation of bad news because the people make it, forget to make the distinction between bad news and that's, you own it as an organization. It's not the person bringing it to your attention. In fact, we need the opposite culture. It might be a false alarm, but I want to make sure I brought it to your attention right away. It may, I don't know what's going to happen, but I want to bring it to your attention before. Maybe it's a false alarm. That's a much better organizational culture than something where people are yelling at the person that's bringing the bad news. Okay? And we also see how lazy, poorly structured incentives lead to dysfunctional behavior. When uh, it's, uh, you know, just this morning I was in. Mumbai teaching this case on computer associates and uh, you know we were going through the exhibits and they had like a bizarre compensation plan that the top three executives would get close to a billion dollars if they kept the stock price above a certain level for 183 days. You know who writes these kind of plans right so we, we find the shocking thing is that we are shocked when we put like dysfunctional incentives in front of people and they behave dysfunctionally. It's, it's every time we can predict what the consequences are. 
and it happens. And it's, it's just we just don't seem to learn from other people's mistakes, right? So we can have good performance management systems. But here are some things that we have to appreciate. All of us, everyone in this room, has got biases. Okay? We can help you, we can help ourselves if you're willing to acknowledge that you have biases. But most of us will fight that. No, no, I don't have bias. I'm a very fair person. Because this challenges our mental image of ourselves. We look in the mirror and we see a fair person. And who is VG to come here and tell you you have biases? Okay? But I'll submit, think about this in your heart of hearts. All of us have biases. We are biased towards people. We can't even explain why we are biased towards them. Maybe they laugh at our jokes. Maybe they went to the same school that we did. Maybe they support the same sports team. I don't know what it is, but we have biases towards people. Now, what ends up happening is that, you know, I'll give you a completely different example. I teach this case where there are three different projects, all very technical projects, and every conceivable calculation, risk index, net present value, everything is calculated, given to the students, and we ask which project would we choose, right? You know, half the class goes by, and then one-third of the students will choose project A, one-third will choose project B, and one-third will choose project C. And I'd be like, how come we all read the same case, same data, it's all very technical, it's not even like emotionally connecting with you, and yet each one of us picked a different project having read the same data. And the more astute students will say, you know, I like project A, so I went back and changed the assumptions a little bit, so that my favorite project comes to the top. Okay? All of us do that. So, we believe we make decisions based on data, but we know what outcome we want. So we rig the model so that it gives the data that we want. So we somehow made a decision in our gut and we start using spreadsheets to rationalize and justify our decisions. Okay? If we can do this for inanimate things, for projects and companies we know nothing about, imagine when we're doing performance evaluation, all of us are doing this. We, when we're evaluating people, very often, I've already made up our mind, we like them or not. And then, we're often doing this to set up. Sometimes people are setting up the people they like for success two, three years from now for a promotion. They come to these meetings and they say all these great things about these people because they know they have to build a coalition and they're being set up. And they might even be doing this without their being aware because they're biased towards something. That's, you know, you, we are human beings. Let's acknowledge that. If we do that, then we can get help. We can, you know, the other ways. You, you need to surround yourself with other people, your peers, who are willing to challenge you and say, oh, VG, you always like this person. That's why you're giving them a high rating. But you know, my experience with this person wasn't all that good. And you're always very hard on this other person. You know, whatever reason, actually, I think they're pretty good. Okay? You need someone who will stand up to you and challenge you, and you need to do the same thing for them. We keep each other honest. Surround yourself with people when you're doing performance evaluation that will keep you honest. But the first step is to acknowledge that I may have biases. And then you need your friends who will help you overcome those biases. But we cannot get subjectivity out of performance evaluation. Like People say, oh no, let's be objective, let's get rid of subjectivity. Unfortunately, how people meet their targets has and will always remain subjective. Right? Whether they step on people's toes, whether they stayed consistent with their values and beliefs, or whether they did it other means, that has to be subjective. So you cannot throw out the subjectivity. Subjectivity is extremely important and is at the heart of performance evaluation. So subjective doesn't mean capricious or biased. It means you invest more in the process. You have to build trust in the performance evaluation system, and it's only through time where time and again you prove that your organization does the right thing when it comes to performance evaluation, that employees slowly begin trusting the organization. And so all high-performance organizations have these characteristics of employees trusting. You know, when, when somebody gets promoted, then they must have done something good. It's not because the boss likes their jokes, okay? It's because there are checks and balances in their organization, and one individual cannot put their imprint on somebody else's performance. It's the whole collective, then, and, and merit wins, right? So I'm going to talk about, you know, this pressure for performance, you know, 
having high expectations of people uh, leads to more innovation. We have talked about that. We also need people the opportunity. We need to give them the freedom so that they can rise to your high expectations. So you don't want to micromanage. You want to give people the freedom. And, you know, sometimes they make mistakes. That's okay. That's how people learn. So you have to let go. You have to delegate. And that's the opportunity piece of this. And I said, when you have the high pressure for performance and the opportunity, you get innovation. But you also get temptation. Okay? Where people want to cut corners and meet targets. It's a lot cheaper in the long run to kill this rationalization. What do I mean by rationalization? So even the most hardened criminal, when they are doing something that they know is unethical, what they do is they find a way to rationalize. Everybody does this. If you want to succeed in my industry, you have to do it. It's all fine and dandy where you're talking about your ivory tower and this other country, things may go according to rules. But in my industry, my part of the world, my corner, Everybody does this. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm not doing this to get the bonus. I'm doing this for the greater good of the company. Incidentally, I might get a bonus, but that's not why I'm doing it. These are all typical rationalizations that we see in organizations. And even the most hardened criminals, before they do something that's unethical, illegal, they have to engage in rationalization. So we have studied. We have studied a lot of these scandals, Enron, WorldCom. And you go down to the individual who actually did it who actually did those journal entries, you find this evidence of this rationalization. In the long run, you don't want to remove the pressure for performance. You need to have high expectations of people. You don't want to remove this opportunity. You want to delegate. You want to give autonomy. In fact, autonomy itself is motivating. There are organizations where the main attraction of working there is that there is meaningful roles for you to do. You don't have to check with the boss for everything. So those are not the places, not the pressure for performance, not the opportunity. Those are not the things that you want to cut to remove this temptation. You want to remove this rationalization. Okay? How are we doing? It's, it's like everyone is like so quiet. <laughs> Hearing patiently. <laughs> okay, so you disagree, you agree, you know. You know, I would love to make this more uh, interactive. Yes? I'm, sh I'm showing the mirror? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, objectivity is the eyes of the subject. But I'm saying, let's acknowledge that exactly what you're saying. That when you change a person from one person to another, Let's not keep insisting just because it's numerical that it's objective. Very often, what con the context makes a difference to how we are interpreting the numbers. Okay. I have a question. Yes, sir. When you said biases, what do you, how do you differentiate biases with prejudice in the mind? So, prejudice is when you've already assumed what it's going to be, right? I think they're very, it's a close cousin of bias. <laughs> <laughs> right? What I mean by bias is, when you are predisposed in a certain way to someone, maybe that's prejudice, the same bad numbers you start saying, yeah, 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 I, so, you know, I, I, I have benefited from bias. Let me put it, let me be very honest, right? Uh, my boss, the dean at Harvard Business School, he was my PhD advisor at Stanford. It's sheer luck for me that he became the dean here at Harvard. And I always feel that I can do no wrong. Like the blue-eyed boy kind of thing, and I feel it's very unfair. Because I walk into a room, he's already thinking like, oh, VG will do well. And that's very empowering for you that to have, know that somebody has your back. Right? He, I think he extends this to all people, but as leaders, you want to think about it. Are you giving everyone a fair shake? So, prejudice has a negative connotation. I'm thinking about bias as sometimes it can even be positive. That is, you, even before the person shows up, you, you made them succeed because you're like, oh, you'll be awesome, you're terrific, lovely to have you here. You put them at ease. Decision making, as you said, sometimes it is with intuition also. that you get Not sometimes, you always. Decision. The biggest decisions are always based on intuition. We like to pretend it's based on numbers, but the toughest decisions are always gut, gut level decisions. Right? It involves emotions, it involves people. The other ones that are, you know, pure numbers are easy to make. 
All right. So we talked about this and to make sure that our employees are not cutting corners, violating our value system, this is where the role of belief systems comes in. And it's extremely important, even more important when tough times are coming to focus on our values and beliefs, right? We think like, no, 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 that's a luxury that you have in good times, but times are tough now, you know, we have to get on with it and survive any which way we can. Nothing can be further from the truth. It's in tough times that your true metal is, is revealed. So now would be the time when, you know, you, you articulate your core values, you go back to your values and beliefs, and you have to be seen as acting on it. So, I, I'll give, you know, Rahul used this example of this online course. Eight years ago, we launched HBS Online. It is a very contentious decision at HBS to go online. There are a lot of people, our alumni, who came up to us and said, what are you doing? You're cheapening the brand. Why would you go online? I paid $110,000 for the seven-week program, and you're going to start giving out this knowledge for, uh, you know, uh, $800? This is like you're cheapening the brand. Don't do this. And, you know, I, I thought long and hard about this because they had paid a lot of money, and it seemed like we are violating the trust. So I went back and we said, 1636, when the university was started, I seriously doubt all the founders of the university got together in a room and said, let's deny knowledge and education to 90% of the people who apply to us. That couldn't have been the purpose with which the university was started. It should have been to educate as many people as possible. It so happened that we are constrained by the number of faculty, by the number of seats in a room, and therefore we have to be fair, and therefore we pick the best and the brightest. So the excellence is uh, something that follows was an accident of our constrained capacity. It was this kind of selectivity that we have to get in was not the purpose of starting the university. Sometimes we end up in situations where we are like the Tiffany's and we start believing that our value comes from the exclusivity. Nothing could be further from the truth. So we went back to our purpose and mission and we said, our mission says to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. Nowhere does it say it has to come by excluding as many people as we can. So we decided to go ahead and we said, okay, we will keep the brand separate. So it will not be an MBA, it will not be a degree, it will be an online certificate. And uh, like Rahul mentioned, I'm so proud. We had like 70,000 people I've been able to teach online. And, uh, you know, it's all people all over the world. So if you stay true to your values in tough times and, uh, you know, you articulate your values, these are meant to inspire people and, uh, you know, uh, walk the talk. And I mentioned it earlier briefly about employees uh, smelling hypocrisy and employees being like uh, uh, children. Okay? I'll give you an example. Uh, my, I have a, a two sons. My older one played squash. And my job was to drive him on the weekends for squash tournaments from Boston to New York, Connecticut, wherever they are, up and down the East Coast. So a captive audience sitting in the back seat you know, uh, father-son bonding time. So I felt like I was defining a new demographic group. They saw, talk about soccer moms, I was a squash dad here, okay? Uh, I had this app on my phone called Waze. Some of you might be using Waze, right? I'm driving on the freeway, going from Boston to New York, and the Waze says, police officer reported ahead. And I hit the brakes. My son looked up, and from his reading a book, looked up and said, Dad, were you speeding? Okay? Simple question. But such a moment of truth for me. Right? My first thought is to like deny. No, 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 I was not speeding. Right? But he's smart. He's going to ask, then why did you hit the brakes if you're not speeding? So the second question was, which had it was a true story. One of, when I moved to Boston, one of my colleagues had told me, you can go five miles above the speed limit and the police will leave you alone, which is what I was doing. It was 65, I was going 70. But if I told my son this, you can go five miles above the speed limit and they won't, you won't get a ticket, I'm telling him, as long as you don't get caught, it's okay to cheat. That did not feel like an acceptable answer either, right? So all this happened in a flash. And I said, yes, I was speeding. There is no way. I want him to follow the rules. I want him to, you know, before he's, he turns 21, I don't want him to start drinking because that's the law. You just follow the law. It's not that hard. 
But the minute I break the speed limit rule and either tell him it's okay or that I'm not, I will have no moral standing to expect him to follow the rules. So if you want your employees to follow the rules, not things, do things that you will not approve, then you don't want to put yourself in situations where you're breaking the rules, right? And the other thing is, I can't look back, see whether my son is sitting in the back seat and then decide whether I'm going to go five miles above the speed. So it has to be all the time. It has to become a habit. It has to be second nature to you. It can't even be a conscious decision. It has to become second nature. And that's one of the things about ethics, right? So uh, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. Uh, you know, Roger Federer was playing in the Wimbledon. And uh, he played this stroke where the ball, you know, hit it, his forehand. It came below the net, but because it's outside the court, it's okay. And it clipped the line and it was in. And they asked him, like, I've never seen you play this stroke before. You know, it was so magical to see you run outside the court, hit it, it comes below the net and it's a winner. How did you play this? And he says, I practice all the time. I think when it comes to your values and beliefs, it's like that. You know, there are maybe four or five instances in your life where it's going to be, your values are going to be tested. But you have to be prepared for it. And the way you prepare for it is by reinforcing your organization's values and beliefs all the time and referring to it when you make decisions so that others in the organization can see that you're living up to it. It can't be, you know, in the moment it'll show up. You have to train for it. It has to become second nature. Okay. So the other side of inspiring people is also telling people, uh, 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 these activities are not okay with us. These are actions that are prescribed, right? We talked about uh, you know, cheating on exams, whatever it is. These actions are unacceptable. You prescribe the actions, you say, yes. So what you're is I think it's a way to build the culture, absolutely. You know, the, the key question is, let's say it's brought by a lot of people, it's coming bottom up, that's terrific. Is it, are you okay with it? As a leader, when you look at this culture, are you okay with it? If it's not, you have to intervene. You can't say it came up, I'm, I don't want to be the one to change it. If, yeah, I'm all for democracy, but if, you know, Again, going back to raising kids, you take a vote and the kids say, we're going to do this. No, you don't always agree with it. So when it comes to matter of values, I don't think it's up for vote. It's not a democratic process. If it, it doesn't tie in with your core values and beliefs, you, you stand up and you say, no, I, ca I can't be part of this. I, I think he was talking about, uh, yes, culture is f framed both by your values and beliefs, but also your boundaries of what kind of actions you will not accept, right? All professions have it, whether it's uh, lawyers or accountants or surveyors, engineers, they have a code of conduct. And there's good reasons why these things exist. We just don't, you know, we take it, we pass the exam, and then it's confined to some shelf in your book, in your library. But, but these are living documents, and uh, if you don't live it, you know, they, they don't serve any purpose, right? So we use these boundary systems and belief systems to kill the rationalization that I talked about, so that nobody has any doubt in their mind that if they did this, they're not going to get the support of the rest of the organization. They don't want to come there and say, I'm doing this for the company, and if something goes wrong, the company will bail me out. No, it will not, and I'm here to tell you that we will not. That needs to be the tone when we're setting these belief and boundary systems. You know, we have this notion that startups are, you know, very entrepreneurial people, we should leave them alone in a garage, give them their lunch and dinner and cook all kinds of food for them and do their laundry, and they'll be extremely innovative. You come back and check in seven years, and great things would have happened, okay? Nothing can be further from the truth. You know, you, when you have high-powered incentives, that's precisely when you need good control systems to make sure that your values are articulated and your boundary systems are delineated, okay? So faster the car, better than brakes need to be. So I'm all for high expectations, and 
great upside, people are talking about equity and giving equity to people, that's all terrific. But you need to balance this by talking about your values and make sure that people are doing it the right way. Okay? So, I want to talk about different ways of motivating. We sometimes go immediately to money and say, pretend like money is the only motivator. I will not deny, money is a great motivator, people work for money, nothing wrong with it. But let's not assume that as human beings, that's the only thing that motivates us. In fact, for many people, I come to believe now that money is almost like keeping score in a basketball game. Oh, you got so much, I get, it's not even, they're not even thinking about what they're going to do with it. It's just a way, an easy, quick way to compare across industries, across functions, across professions, like what am I worth to the organization? They start using money as a proxy for it. There are very many other ways of motivating people, right? Meaningful roles, I'll get promoted, I'll get a significant role, as a leadership role in the organization. That's a powerful motivator. Peer recognition, it matters immensely to me what my colleagues think of me. And it matters to all of us. So we will do amazing things to get the recognition of our peers. And that's an important motivator. So, you, you know, I'm standing at an award ceremony. You know, what more do I need to say about how motivating that is? You, to get an award in front of, you know, people that you value can be a very powerful motivator, right? Uh, meaning and purpose in work by itself. I might be doing the same thing, but, you know, there are physicians, there are nurses, they're helping people. That's very that's a very powerful motivator. You see a smile on someone's face. As a professor, I'll confess to it. You know, I don't get stock options, I don't get paid more or get paid less based on how I teach. But when, when the student comes up to you and says, you know, what you said five years ago really helped me, I can't think of a greater reward. Okay? So there are many, many ways in which we can motivate people. But the important thing is context matters. So you want to reach in and pick the right tool to motivate people. And context will tell you how to do that. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples, very different incentive methods, or very different ways of motivating people, both equally effective and both very powerful. Okay? And the other thing I want to tell you is it's not just about incentives, it's also about recruiting. You a lot of this is set when someone enters the organization. And, you know, that is the point of most leverage. If you can communicate your values that you have, at least some of the people should look at your offer and say, no, 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 I'm not a good fit for your organization. If no one is saying that, then you're not communicating your values to the organization. So it has to be that you're a good fit for some people, but not for everyone. Okay? So recruiting matters, and who does the recruiting, and whether those are the culture carriers of the organization, and they are participating in the recruiting, matters immensely. All right. So I'm going to give you an example of Henkel. You might have all heard of Henkel. It's a large, uh, fast-moving consumer goods company based in Germany. So it's a family business, and it was a very happy underperformer. That's how they describe themselves. Always number two, number three, very happy to be an underperformer, right? For decades, 90% of the employees would say they met their key objectives. But yet, the company as a whole never met its objective. So they brought in someone from, from the outside, Casper Rorsted. He actually came from the IT industry. And uh, he asked this very basic question. How is it possible that this organization, 90% of the people year after year say met all their objectives, yet the company as a whole hasn't met its objectives ever in the last one decade. We have to change that, right? So he does the usual things, which you know, basically surgery. The situation had got the health of the company was so bad that they needed the surgery and he performed the surgery. So they shut down 60 plants, they uh, downsized, they laid off 13,000 people. You know, uh, they consolidated a lot of the services in Philippines, in Mexico. Uh, they went from 900 brands to 450 brands. You know, the typical things that you might expect. These are the hard decisions, right? But the hard decisions are not the, really the hard ones. The soft ones are the hard ones, right? So what came after that is like he put in a new performance management system, put in a force curve. I'll, I'll show you the graph of the force curve. And announced all this right before the uh, 2008 financial crisis. And all through the crisis, refused to change the target. 
He said, five years from now, this is the target. Quarter after quarter, he would say, the target is the target. We, don't, we are not going to change it. doesn't matter that we have the Great Recession. We made it public, and he went and announced it publicly, and you tell the employees, you know, if I don't meet it, I have to go. I've announced it publicly. He almost used this as a commitment device, right? And, you know, we don't have the time. You should watch a video of his. I'm sure it's on YouTube. He's the most brutally honest person you'll ever meet. You know, he'll call it the way he sees it and give it direct to people. And, you know, here the same things about reiterating values and beliefs. They went through the exercise. They articulated the values and beliefs. And, you know, this is their performance management system. And what is interesting is, not only is the performance on a forced curve, top 10%, 60%, 25%, bottom 5%, but also what are your promotion prospects? What is your prom uh, potential? And there were, there were people that were in the top 10%, but there were no promotion prospects for them. Okay? Because they might have been a staff function, head of R&D. You know, if you're thinking that somehow you're going to be in a fast-moving consumer goods company, the next CEO, tough luck. I have to tell you, you have risen as high as you're going to go in this organization. They were brutally honest with the people. Okay? Some people actually left, but others were like, you know, I get it. You know, this is my function, this is how I am going to go. It's okay. I find my job rewarding. I'm happy to do that. And this S1, T1, and T2, these were the you know, the uh, blue-eyed boys, they can do no wrong, right? They want these people, they're very successful, uh, they're in the top 10% and very high potential, and this was like widely rewarded. The company did well, you know, good things happened, okay? But for me, this is not sustainable. What I find in many organizations is that this kind of surgery is very important and very good to get you out of a complacency where you have been stuck for a long period of time. You can get a turnaround. But a turnaround is not going to be sustainable in the long run. Because if you keep dismissing the bottom 5% year after year after year, you'll run out of people that are truly in the bottom 5%. Then after that, you're getting rid of people because you're stuck with the system. And that impact that has on sort of people becoming very competitive with each other rather than acting as a team is Horrible, right? So, of course, Casper Rost had left Henkel and he's gone, okay? But I don't find this kind of forced curve in a good high-performing organization to do it year after year is that sustainable. So, I'll give you a different example of... So, that was effective, what they needed at the time, but not something that is, I would say, sustainable. Here's a different example of what I find uh, works very well. There's this bank based in Sweden called Handelsbank. Okay? Very interesting bank. They have no bonuses. They don't give out any bonuses. What they do is, when they make excess profits, they use the excess profits to, to put it in a pool and buy shares in the bank itself. So one of the largest shareholders of Handelsbanken is this pool of money that has been given to the employees. Right? It's opposite of everything we teach in finance, which is to diversify. They're in fact doubling up on the risk by using employees' money to buy shares in the company itself. Everyone gets the same dollar amount. You could be the CEO or you could be someone that was recruited last week, fresh out of college. It doesn't matter. The bonus is the same dollar amount. Not percentage of salary, same dollar amount. And you will not see any penny of it till you retire. Let's say the retirement age is 65. Nothing is given out till you retire. Okay? They have no budgets. They don't spend one dime on advertising or marketing, ever. All the performance data is public. How you did, what are your metrics, they measure everything, and it's publicly shared within the organization. If you want to know how, someone, how much someone is paid, what their numbers were, what their sales targets were, and how, how much they achieved, everything is publicly shared. Okay? And tremendous autonomy. If you want to give a higher interest rate on a deposit in your branch, go for it. If you want to charge less for a loan product than what you're prescribed, go for it. All you have to do is justify and write it down, and everybody else can see what, why, what your justifications are. People look at this and say, this is crazy. This is going to be so risky 
when everyone gets to make these loan decisions and deposit decisions, so much autonomy, no targets, no budgets, I mean, they have targets, but no budgets, no bonuses, how will they even motivate people? Or they will say, oh, this will work in, in Scandinavia, it will not work outside Scandinavia. They have lots of branches in UK, and they follow the same uh, system of performance management in UK as well. When they moved to UK, people said, ours is a bonus culture. Banking means bonus. People work for the bonus. The only way they come to work, they stay motivated, is the bonus. There is no way you can come to UK and say we are a no-bonus bank. Okay? But they have had incredible success for a very, very, like 42 years, they have had the same model in Sweden, in UK, everywhere else they go. They have done very, very well with this. Okay, let me push ahead. So, I picked the data around right after the financial crisis of 2008, right? Return on equity has not been below 12% for any single quarter during the financial crisis. Very high levels of performance through the financial crisis. Uh, what about customer satisfaction? Much better than any of their peers, not just in Sweden, but in Norway, Denmark, Finland, UK, everywhere. Not just consumers, but corporate clients as well. Distinctly higher customer satisfaction. So this is not coming at the expense of the financial performance, is not coming at the expense of their customers. Okay? This autonomy, and you can make loans to whoever you want, you would think that it will show up, manifest itself in bad loans at some point. They have one-fifth of the loan losses of any of their peers from 1997 to 2013, right? Long period of time when they trust people and you haven't given them crazy incentives, lo and behold, the employees actually do the right thing, okay? So, you know, their annual average uh, uh, loan losses is one-fifth of what it is for their peers. So I'm coming back to these uh, four levers of control. We've talked about, you know, uh, performance where holding high expectations of people, importance of values, importance of boundaries. But I haven't spoken much about this uh, fourth lever, which is what we call the interactive control systems. Because that's what positions the organization for tomorrow. We talked about sustainable high performance, but all the things I've spoken so far is only about high, having high performance organization for today. How do we sustain this over time? Turns out that this environment is always changing and we get so caught up in our performance for today that we lose sight of what opportunities and threats are. So we need a formal system to keep track of this. Okay? So what are these uncertainties that we need to track? Okay? So the typical ones are competition, technology, regulation, customer skills, and reputation. So you think of these four or five, six items and say, how, what is the formal system by which we are going to track this? So let's take competition, for example. So we have seen so many industries disrupted. There's someone that comes at the bottom end. You know, the classic example is the uh, iron and steel industry. Uh, you know, they started taking scrap metal and uh, smelting them in arc furnaces. And the quality was so bad initially, the only thing you could use this was to put the bars that go inside the concrete. You couldn't use the steel to do anything. You can't make cars with it. You can't do it anywhere else. Only thing you could do is put it for a bar inside the concrete. And so what did the, when the, uh, the integrated iron mills, when they saw someone melting the scrap iron and doing this, so much junk in there, so such low quality, you know, that's good enough only for concrete. You can take that industry. The margins anyway are so bad in that rebar that I'm not even going to bother. So they moved up and they said, we'll spend more on R&D and we'll go high end. We'll seed this low end to this, uh, 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 you know, where they smell, uh, 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 melt this scrap iron. But these guys kept doing R&D uh, more and more and the quality got good enough for the next higher level product. So every five to 10 years, the integrated steel mills will abandon the low end of the market, and those guys steadily kept marching, going above, above. And today, the whole industry, except the very, very top end, has been completely taken over by the people that start with scrap iron, okay? We see this kind of disruption in industry after industry where you look at somebody 
they're at the low end, you yeah, know, it'll go away, but it doesn't. So this is where we need to keep track and say what's happening. Again, going back to the HBS decision to go online, we wanted to disrupt ourselves. If somebody else is going to come in and take our lunch, let's do it ourselves. We can't imagine 25 years from now that online is not going to be a big factor in higher education. If it's going to be, let's participate in it. At least we get to frame the rules of the game rather than what happened in the media industry where information was given away for free and all of a sudden no one is paying. All of, they trained all of us by giving away free information. Is the same thing going to happen in education? Well, let's see if we can not have the same uh, outcome as what happened in media, right? So, keep track of competition. Keep track of uh, technology. How do these meetings exist? It feels very abstract when I talk about this interactive control system. So you have, you know, if you're a retail store chain or a bank, let's say you have a hundred branches. You put all of them in a room like this and you have a presentation from someone who's sort of the best performing branch. But you also have a presentation by someone who's the, let's call it the worst performing branch. The idea is not performance evaluation. The idea is not to celebrate someone who's had great success or to hurt someone who's not doing as well. The idea is to learn and say, wow, whatever is happening to you could happen to everyone else, good or bad. What can we learn? And what does it mean as an opportunity or a threat for the rest of the organization? That is the role of these interactive control systems. Okay, so let me pause there and ask uh, any questions? Any comments? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, I hope we can inspire people. I hope we don't have to just use a stick to uh, get the right thing to do. But boundary systems are implicitly, you know, they tell the consequences. I hope when people look at the boundary systems, they don't feel fear, but they look at this and say, our organization, I can count on everyone doing the right thing. Right? That's a more positive framing. But if they do engage in practices that are not acceptable to us, it does end up being fear. So if you don't do anything wrong, why should you fear? Yes? Sorry. We call it the consequence management plan. So anything positive, we call it incentive plan. And anything negative is a consequent management plan. And I think both are equally important yes. and everybody is giving it. Yeah, I just use different yeah. labels, belief systems and boundary systems. But you need both. Another thing, in terms of, um, uh, you know, nowadays there is equal importance of not just what you do, but also how, how you, you do, do it. Yeah. So it's, it's really good to see, you know, you explaining to us the importance of it. But I think that there are many organizations now in India, especially for frontline sales as well, where even the how matters. So the boundary systems, etc. is good so conversation. When, so when I talked about these interactive control systems, uh, you know, I'm on the board of like a few organizations. I always go and check online. What are the customers talking about us? What are the employees, glassdoor.com, etc. What are the employees talking about us? It's in those places that you pick up, you know, the, the reality of what's going on. Because sometimes you can get caught up, your financial performance look good, the management is giving you all these reports and you can be like, wow, we are awesome. And then you go, brutally honest feedback from your customers and your employees, they hold a mirror to your face and you know, okay, let's follow up on this. And when you follow this, then the management also starts following this. Okay, so absolutely, a point well taken. So how you do things matters, not just what targets you met. Did you step on toes? Did you keep your customers happy or did it by sort of, you know, being very short term? absolutely matters. So what your employees feel today, your employees, uh, your, what your customers feel today, your employees will feel tomorrow, what your employees feel tomorrow, your f shareholders will feel the day after. That definitely that chain works. Okay. Other questions, comments? So I, I'll wrap up with this. Uh, I do want to uh, uh, mention one thing to you. It feels so special and I want to thank uh, Rahul for uh, inviting me to talk to you. Like he said, I'm a local uh, Chennai boy is the phrase that he used, yes I am. Uh, but I'd like to think of my, myself as a local Pan-India boy and uh, 
uh, thank you for this opportunity. Really love the interaction. I hope to uh, spend more time talking to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you like the video, do like, comment, share, and subscribe.